Okay, we're going to move on to linear operators. So for linear operators, we have the operator is a mapping from one vector space to another. So we have some vector space, which we call the input space. So there's, so VI, and we have an output space, VO. And so an operator is something that maps from one vector space to another. So this uh, operator could map from the set of functions that are polynomials to a set of continuous function on the real line that are defined between the values of 0 and 1. Or this could be a mapping from a set of polynomials to a n an n let's say nth order polynomial to let's say an n plus 1 order um, vector. Okay? A vector. So a mapping from one vector space to another. You have an input space and an output space. So as, again, you think of a function, you have something going in and something coming out. The something that's coming in is coming in from some space. And what comes out is going to be in some space. And the two spaces in general will not be diff will not be the same. Okay, so that's the concept. And so a linear operator, T is a linear, if we call T the linear operator, it takes something from the input space and maps to something in the output space. And it satisfies this relationship. T, if I take a weighted sum of vectors in the vector's input space, then I will get a weighted sum of the function operating on the individual vectors. Okay, And so these constants, alpha and beta, are arbitrary scalars in the field over which the vector space is defined. And v1 and v2 are arbitrary elements of vi. So this is the defining property for a linear operator. So an operation on a linear combination is a linear combination of the operations. So this is the basic definition. Now let's see uh, some, some facets of this. First of all, we're going to talk about something called uh, uh, a, a basis. We'll talk more about bases in a little bit, but if we have a set of n vectors for vi, so a basis is a set of vectors that are that are independent in VI. And so it, we can show that for any x in the input space, that that x can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Okay, And so if we plug that x now into our linear operator, and we're operating now on this sum, that operation on a weighted sum is equal to the weighted sum of the operations on the individual vectors. And so we have that, that property. So here I've defined this as a basis only so that I can express any x as a weighted sum of those vectors. So in terms of the linear operator, there are basically we have the defining property. But that defining property can actually be broken up into two separate properties. There's the additivity property and the homogeneity property. The additivity, additivity problem property says that if I have two vectors in the vector space and I operate on them, I'll get the sum of the operations on the individual vectors. The homogeneity says that if I multiply by a scalar, any, any vector in the input space, and I take the operation on that, I get the scalar times the operation on the individual x. So based on these two properties, here's a question. This let's say we have a function that does these two things. What if if x is zero, what must that operator equal? It turns out this is a trick question. I'll let you stew on that answer. Okay, now for any operator, there are important subspaces for, an op for any operator. So if I have, again, an input space and an output space and an operator in that, that goes from one to the other, one important subspace is called the kernel or the null, the null space. So you may see a number of different names for it. This is basically the set of vectors from the input space that when you plug them into the function, you get zero on the output. Okay, 
So that's the null or the kernel. The range or the image is the set of all possible outputs from an operator. Okay, the set of all possible. So that is, if I take every element in this set, put it through the function, I'll get some set here. That's the range. Okay, so graphically we can see it this way. In general, in the null space, I may have some subspace in that space, so that when I plug in, when I plug in um, any of these values, I get zero over here. So all of these values map into zero. The range is such that if I take every element in the entire set, I'll get a set over here in the output space. That's called the range. So in general, the range will be a subspace of the output space. And you can actually go through and show that both the null space or the kernel and the range are true subspaces, that they satisfy those de defining properties for a subspace, right? It needs it itself needs to be a vector space. That is, it needs to be closed under addition and scalar multiplication. And it also needs to be completely contained within the space. And, and clearly you can you can show that those, those are satisfied by both the null space and the range. Okay, so this is the basic definition. Now we're going to get in. We're going to get in a little bit later and look at each of these in in greater depth. But for now, this is the basic definitions. So we've been talking about linear operators, okay, and and we've been talking very generally. Now let's kind of get a little bit more concrete and look specifically at matrices as linear operators. So we can go through and show that matrices satisfy the additivity and homogeneity properties of the linear operator. And, and these are, in general, the simplest non-trivial cases of linear operators. So in this case, t of x is just a times x. So a is an m by n matrix. Okay, So a m by n matrix, x then must be n-dimensional, an n-dimensional vector. Okay, So this is a linear operator. And we, we're going to use this particular linear operator a lot. But we're actually going to use some of the other linear operators. And those other linear operators are going to be very important for us. So th these, this is the basics of linear operators.